for joining us for today's uh, webinar um, and uh, with Ledger Leopard on supply chain traceability. We have Olivier Riquin, the CEO of Ledger Leopard with us today, and Milo Kluster, the founder of RTI Blockchain. It'll be an interesting discussion for you. Before we get started, um, I want to just emphasize that all are welcome here in the Hyperledger community. Um, all our meetings are open to the public, open for anyone to join and participate in, and we welcome your participation. Um, you can find more information on the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, which we do follow in this webinar. We also have an antitrust policy which governs all meetings at the Linux Foundation. Um, we are recording this session, so that recording will be available on our um, webinar page after this session, including um, any download there is for the slides. We are also live streaming the session currently right now as well. We really encourage a lot of um, uh, participation and engagement in these webinars where we feel that these, this is a moment for you to get whatever you can out of it. Um, our speakers have dedicated their time to be here. Um, so take advantage of that. So please, you can raise your hand and we can ask you to jump off mute. Um, you can put your questions and comments in the QA box or, in the chat. So um, please, uh, we welcome your engagement throughout. Um, just a quick intro on Hyperledger overall. Um, if you're new to us, we are a collaborative project under the Linux Foundation. We have many different kinds of distributed ledger technologies, tools, and resources. And um, if you're looking to learn more about that, please visit our website at hyperledger.org. And I'll have some links about that later on um, at the end. Okay, without further ado then, um, I'll welcome um, Olivier and Milo to get the discussion started. Yes, I unmute myself now. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you for the invitation to, to come uh, talk a bit more about Ledger Leopard and, of course, much more about RTI Blockchain, one of our clients that we've been collaborating with for a long time now already, for more than a year at least, uh, providing uh, services to build their, their um, what I think it's a beautiful solution for the market. But that's all up for Milou to uh, tell more about it in a later stage. Um, before um, I'm going to hand it over to Milou, let me briefly introduce uh, uh, Ledger Leppard as a company. Uh, like I said, my name is Olivier Rikke, and together with uh, Jeroen van Mechelen, I've been uh, running Ledger Leopard for the last few years. And uh, we are an Amsterdam based company that was fully specialized in blockchain from the beginning. Uh, Jeroen and I both being uh, really blockchain um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and early adapters here in the industry in the Netherlands. And um, over the past few years, we, we witnessed an uh, explosive growth of our company. Um, which is always a good thing. Um, we have a team of approximately 75, uh, 75 people working for us full time on blockchain solutions, um, but also for broader technology solutions in itself. Um, and with over 20 clients serving simultaneously, we do can say that we are the, the biggest blockchain solution provider in, in, in the Benelux, uh, together with uh, companies like IBM which we sometimes compete with, sometimes work together in consortia to, to uh, come up with solutions, et cetera. So um, we've been acting since 2017, uh, officially, I think, in a scale-up phase. And uh, what I would like to emphasize on is that we, we really focus on proven technology solutions. So uh, unlike a lot of other blockchain companies, we, yes, of course, we support uh, proof of concepts and demos, but we are really focusing on translating proof of concept and demos into live um, work in products and services of which RTI is one of them. And um, if you take a look at what we do, uh, what are the general solutions that we work on? Um, it's um, uh, basically uh, our, our biggest pillar at the moment is the identity solutions to, together with supply chain solutions and administration solutions that we work on. 
uh, all blockchain based. So um, uh, either in, in, in supply chain solutions like RTI, like we're going to talk today about, but also do a lot of work uh, with regards to, to SSI. Also use uh, Hyperledger, by the way, Hyperledger Indy in this case, and for RTI, we're using Hyperledger Bezu. Um, and besides that, uh, of course, we do a lot of um, um, uh, things with regards to helping companies set up blockchains, maintaining blockchain, uh, hosting solutions, software development, app development, etc. But that uh, should be more than enough about um, uh, uh, Ledger Leopard. If you have any questions, you can visit our website. But I do want to emphasize on uh, RTI, which is a company that came up to us um, uh, beginning of last year. Um, I knew them from um, um, a Yes Delft incubator program, and, and they contacted me if uh, if we could help them uh, really translating their their product from a demo state into a live production state. And this is where I'll stop talking. And this is a, a, a very natural moment for Milou to take over. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Oliver. So I am Milou Kloster. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I started studied international business and management. And um, there I came across for the first time uh, ERP systems like uh, SAP. So I did my minor in SAP and I did my a graduation at Oracle. And um, once I was graduated, I could start working in our family owned business as the fifth generation. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to work uh, with my father together in the business. And what they do is that they sell smoked fish to supermarkets um, throughout Europe. So this is where also the idea to start RTI blockchain uh, kicks in, because if you are selling to different retail companies and food service companies, they decide on which type of returnable transport items you have to deliver your goods on. And returnable transport items are items like crates, pallets, roll containers. So... Um, once I was working at the business and we were selling to uh, each supermarket, I had to administrate all the movements of these items. And this is a massive administrative hassle. So um, um, we didn't have at first time when I started working there an ERP system. So I, start, I started thinking, OK, I'm going to implement one. And I want to have a good registration mod module in it for my returnable transport item, but that was not the case. So I started using Excel again. And now I always say Excel is our biggest competitor. <laughs> so what happens is that each company that is working with returnable transport items is using Excel as the basis for the administration. And from that Excel, you are filling in your own ERP systems, but also all these different dashboards you need because you need to rent these items often. So you need to report all these movements. And it costed me a lot of time and a lot of money uh, to administrate it. And I thought, okay, I have to work with my supply chain partners together and share the data. And I was trying to find a solution for that. And um, I couldn't find an existing one. So I was uh, thinking maybe I have to quit my job and I have to look into all these different kinds of items and see if I can develop a system uh, myself. Um, while I was searching for a system like that, I came across uh, a blog written by Eve, who is also a co-founder right now. And he stated uh, load carrier management for, uh, well, load carriers are used for common good. So that was the trigger for me to contact Eve and to start this uh, company we have now, because we are all using load carriers to get our products from A to B. So everything you use in daily life has been once transported on or with a returnable transport item. It could also be the sea containers. It could also be, uh, be the beer crates. Um, uh, the wine bottles are, are, are shipped on pallets, um, but also uh, cables for electricity are used, uh, are, are ripped around cable drums. So everything needs to be transported, but also needs to be administrated because these items need to be returned and to be reused. So it was much bigger than I first thought, and that made it much more um, interesting, of course. 
So I started um, drawing the business model with Eve, and then we came up with the name Archive Blockchain, and we thought, okay, we need to use blockchain to share the data with your um, supply chain partners, or not even share to work with your supply chain partners in the same data. So if I'm shipping 10 crates, for example, to Olivier, he also has to accept these 10 crates. But what currently happens is that we use a lot of paper packaging slips. So I write down um, these 10 items and Olivier is reading this one as a seven. So he um, administrates 70 items. So there we already have this mismatch, but costs us both a lot of money because at the end of the month or at the end of each quarter or the end of each year, we are going to look at our balance. Okay, Oliver, how much did I ship to you and how much did we return? And um, what is the difference between it? And if we are all working in our own Excel and in our own environment, we have uh, a lot of differences. And therefore we need to do a lot of balance reconciliation. And yeah, there are always losers in this process. So if we work together in the same data, Oliver sees that I reported 10, and Oliver can change it to 70, but he can. I can also see that. So later on, I will also give you a quick demo to show you what we have done and how this works in practice. This is only a small example of what we can solve, um, but when we talk to the organizations, to our users, returnable transport items are the highest uncontrolled costs organizations have and we make it visible again, so you can make a budget on it. I could also see oh, someone is saying in the chat, but it's only high. <laughs> so um, perhaps it is fun to show you what we did and what we have built with Ledger, why we use Ledger and why we use uh, Hyperledger. So after seeing it, you have uh, an image and um, yeah, everything will be more clear. So I will share my screen. Yeah, and, 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 want to and, say something? Yeah, and in, in the meantime, while you're sharing your screen, um, um, uh, what we really liked about the project in itself is that you really found a, a nice um, solution for a real life problem uh, in the supply chain that wasn't necessarily um, uh, connected to supply chain provenance, because that's the solutions that you see a lot in the supply chain world with using blockchain, but really that you wanted to create a system like you guys said it, it should be as easy as mobile banking, uh, but yeah. then for returnable um, uh, items in this case. So that was um, a challenge well accepted from your side for uh, by us. So that's that's what we really liked about this uh, this this project. Yes, that's true. So um, we said we wanted it to be easy to use for everyone in the supply chain. So from the grower to the stores and the whole return flow, but also for each sector. And Eve is really good in um, painting in PowerPoint. So we made these print screens of mobile banking and we said it should be as easy as these screens. And um, in the beginning, it was quite hard to manage because we built um, our first prototype ourselves before Ledger. And then we found out that blockchain was the right technology to use it. Actually, uh, Hyperledger Base, by then already, from the beginning, we are using Hyperledger Base. But the front end wasn't the way we would wanted it to be. And um, it didn't look like this mobile banking. So we couldn't go to the users and say, okay, we use blockchain. We can You can communicate with your supply chain parties. And it is as easy as internet banking because it wasn't. And if it is not that easy, People in the supply chain um, who are working on their business every day, they are not going to use it because it should fit directly in the processes. So that's really what, what we wanted to focus on with Ledger and they are doing a really good job. I'm sharing my screen at the moment so everyone can see. This is the dashboard that we create. We have also a mobile application available, but I will just show it uh, to you in web. What we uh, see here is an overview of the shipments. And what we report is a date, a unique ID from the uh, shipment, a from location, who is the one who is shipping the items, a to location, who is the receiver, the type of items, and we have uh, different statuses. This could be new, it could be in transit. Let me see if I have it here. It could be completed or it could be in 
discussion, in dispute. Uh, and then the action to take would be at me, the sender of the goods, or at the receiver of the goods. So this is the overview of the shipments. And when, when I'm opening one, let me see. You could also see where it is. So when uh, a shipment is in transit, you can see at the status bar on top that it is in transit to your organization. You can see the departure location, the destination, and you could see a third party who can also watch some specific items in this shipment. So what is really important in supply chain when shipping goods from A to B, that the data is not out in the open because it is only between you and your supply chain partners. So the sender of the goods can decide to share the data with some third parties who uh, are also part of the shipment and who need to know. So for example, when I'm renting a specific type of crate and I uh, need to report when I'm shipping this crate from A to B, I can inform this party about the shipment directly. So he also has real-time overview of where his crates are. And uh, the more valuable data these um, lenders get, these poolers we call them, the more they are able to reuse them again and again so they can improve their uh, cycle time. If I'm using different type of items, I could also um, um, inform another party about that specific item without seeing them uh, for these third parties. So in this example, Koi and Co can only see CBL7, which is a type of crate. But if I want to inform Oliver about the pallet I am sending, he could only see the pallet. So the data is always between the parties you like and not out in the open for everyone. These shipments are resulting in a balance. I have to move myself around all the time. And this balance, this is very important for the balance reconsolidation. So you always look together in the same balance. For example, if I'm looking at CHAP, I can see that my debit to CHAP is 140 pallets. And with COI and Co, I can see that I have two other types of items and my debit is 300. Uh, 62. And then I'm going to a different administration to Coinco. Of course, he sees it the other way around with my organization. I can go to the different set from Coinco. I can go to his balance and share it with my administration. And you can see this as a credit. So now you see the proof of that working together in the same data never get discussions because we are always looking into the same. Uh, this is the most important function of what we do and where we can save a lot of costs throughout the whole supply chain for every organization which is using a type of returnable transport item. So this could also be uh, for sea con containers which are uh, moving around the world, but also for these cable drums or uh, for crates, everything you like. Um, we have built some functions around it to make it even more easier. You can manage your relations and you can set up rules beforehand. And most important, you can connect these applications to your existing uh, ERP or warehouse management systems. So you don't have to fill it in double uh, every time again. Um, if we come to current uses of RTIs, what we often see is that they are administrating the same data again and again and again in different platforms. So you can connect it through our platform with RTI dashboard, and we can distribute this data to every other supply chain party you have. Um, I can make a shipment from Pepine to Bone. You can see here I'm locked in as Pepine, and on this step I'm locked in as Bone. And you can see how quickly it is when the shipments arrive at Bone and how everyone can see the same data within a shipment, while the others can't, which are not part of the shipment. I will make a new outbound shipment. I will ship it to Bone, and I will select some items. And I do get this pop-up because I can also use unique identifiers. So 
it doesn't have to be, but if they are foreseen from uh, RFID tags, IoT devices, or just the barcodes, you can scan the barcodes with the application on a mobile phone or your handheld. I could also add a palette to it. I can confirm. And I could add different attachments. This could be uh, also a picture taken from the uh, paper packaging slip, but this could also be the digital um, packing slip more companies are using nowadays, but it could also be a signature and uh, it will also state a date and the time of, of arrival and the location. I will create the shipment. I will get a summary if I like it. I could also turn this off. And now you, the new shipment has been made. It's on top. I'm making a boo-boo myself right now. It's this one, it's the second on the 20th, of course. Today is the 20th. And you can see that there is also a third party involved only for the CDL 7 crate and not for the Euro pallet. So I will show you later on what's very important about that. And I will mark it as in transit. This could also be done by the driver. I will go to Bone, so the other administration, which will be the receiver of this shipment. He also has it directly, so it is very fast, real time. And I'll do it again. It's this one, it's in transit, the second line, and it stated 10 crates with a unique identifier and a Euro palette. And Bone could accept this shipment, but he could also say, okay, no, it wasn't 10, it was 70. So he changes it, he confirms, and he saves the correction. And you can directly see that this is in dispute. And me as the sender could also see that this is, shipment is in dispute and that the action is on me. So for me, I will open it again and I can see what has been changed. And I can see that Bone BV added 60 type of crates. And because I see it real time, I can directly grab the phone or um, uh, call with my client, call with my supply chain partner and say, hey, okay, why is it not 10 and 70 instead of doing it three months later on? Now we all remember it because it's fresh in our memories. But I could also see it in attachments once the, these are added. And I could approve this correction because I agreed on it but I could also decline it again. When I go to Coinco and I go to the shipments, it was this shipment and I was a third party and I can only see the crate because I was informed only for the crate and I don't see the zero pellets. These privacy layers are very important in the whole supply chain business because we don't want to share the data with everyone. So the one who's sending the goods is always in charge with whom you want to share the data with. And the data you share is always real time. So you're this, always this, in charge. Yeah, and, and, and this, this was also one of the, 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 the first challenges we really had to tackle. Uh, because if you do everything on chain, obviously everybody can see everything from each other. And that was something we didn't want to. So we really had to uh, come up with a, a smart solution in order to do so while preserving all the benefits of using a blockchain system being uh, beneath it. Yeah, exactly. I see a lot of questions. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen and see if I can go to the questions. Thanks, we, we've been going uh, back and forth um, with yeah. um, uh, one of the participants, um, a question we did get a little bit earlier um, was about whether or not you could uh, share more, I don't know if this is alleviate about the reference architecture, just a little bit more about how it's built. Do you have like a, any sort of um, um, like model of that or, or, how, or maybe talk a little bit about how and why you used Hyperledger Base 2 for this? Olivia, oh, you're, you're on, on mute. mute. You're on mute, Olivier. 
All right, uh, rookie mistake here, sorry. Um, no, so um, the, the reason that we used Hyperledger Bezu actually is to have the benefits of the Ethereum elements, uh, being able to build uh, solid smart contracts, etc., being able to create tokens, uh, these kind of things, but also to set it up in a very controllable way, a proof authority network in this case, um, uh, to make sure it's A, scalable, and B, um, that it is um, um, uh, uh, that it, it is under the governance of the, um, uh, the, the, the various node owners that are known. Uh, that's also an important part, um, and that you are obviously also in control from any transaction cost. Um, uh, because one of the things uh, we cannot afford in this business, obviously, uh, being the transport and logistics, which is always a very low margin business, is having a huge fluctuation with regards to gas pricing. Uh, for transactions so regular ethereum wouldn't go in in this way so that was one of the main reasons to do so another challenge uh, besides the privacy part that i was uh, talking about um, uh, was also that uh, the potential um, um, uh, transaction volume can be huge in this system so we have to design the system in such a way that uh, the transactions per second uh, will always be feasible to to um, uh, to to uh, to use, and that was why a lot of the public systems would uh, fall off immediately, and we had to go with a, a high pleasure version. Um, I cannot share a a, a, a reference architecture here, uh, a uh, because it's not on my laptop directly, so and and I'm not one of the tech guys, and b I should ask RTI if that's okay because <laughs> basically they're the owners of the of the system in this case and we're we're the, the builders for them so I, I i couldn't do that thank you um one thing that i wanted to learn a little bit more about um milu when you were talking earlier about how you were using excel a lot and even the paper slips how yeah. did you make that transition from the paper slips to now using something that's fully online and digital. Um, what were the, what was the process for that, and 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 how did that work for you? Yeah. So um, I first started implementing this ERP system in our business. So every movement towards the supermarket was already known. So it stated not only the product and the price but also these load carriers i was sending to each supermarket so the data was in the erp system it is known but i didn't get it out of it in the right report so um, um for example if i am delivering my crates to you but i pick them up at olivers my balance in the erp system isn't right anymore so um i made a copy from that data into excel and that was my basis. And from that, I was filling in these dashboards. But the data, um, when I was shipping it to the supermarkets, the shipment data, which is known, is the right data. So if I can send it directly to RTI dashboard, I don't need to use Excel because RTI dashboards keeps track of the balance. Where did I pick it up? How much do I have left somewhere? So it is very easy to get rid of Excel. But sometimes it is very hard for the biggest companies, um, mainly because they could use five Excels or more in practice before they can send their invoice for these types of crates and pallets. Often there are uh, deposit fees attached to it. So you need to send invoices and send credit notes as well. Mm -hmm. So we show them what our system can do. We often start very small, so not with all your supply chain partners but we start with uh, 10 and then we start registrating it and once you have the trust in the platform and you see that the data is real time and you don't have these discussions anymore we can connect it via the api with your own system and then you can attach all your supply chain partners to it ideally every partner in your supply chain is also working on this platform because then you have this interaction together and you can see, okay, this is confirmed, this isn't. But we all know that not your whole supply chain is going to change to this dashboard. Mm -hmm. So what we did is that you can create dummy locations. So you can create supply chain partners yourself in the dashboard and you can send them an invite to join. Then they can register themselves if they like to, but if they won't, they can register uh, as well for free and they can see 
into the data, into the shipment, you are shipping with them, outbound and inbound, but they can't um, actively registrate with you. They have just this few option, mm -hmm. but you can do your whole administration with this party. So for each supply chain partner you have, active or inactive, you can complete your whole administration regarding RTIs in our dashboard. So that makes it possible for not using Excel sheets anymore. Mm -hmm. If both parties are active, it makes it also possible for not using this paper packing slips anymore for RTIs. But when you are passing borders, you need to have, for example, um, this bill of lading, or uh, we call it also a CMA. We can't take that away because this is a legal document. But you can you see that this is uh, becoming more digital. We are also integrating with um, an initiative, Transfollow, who is having this digital CMR, this digital bill of lading. Mm. And you can attach this also to a shipment. So that's the um, your paper, yeah, your digital packing slip right. in the attachment. Right. So you don't need this paper slip anymore. So for both, we have a solution. That's thank you. That's uh, such a thorough explanation. It's uh, um, I really appreciate that. Um, I think um, it spurred a lot of questions, Milu. So we have a number of questions. I want to see if I can invite um, some of our participants to come off mute. Um, Marco, would you like to um, ask your question? Uh, yes, of course. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, my question was on the identification of the uh, pallets. Um, is that always done in the same way? So is there a code, uh, for instance, a 2D code or a QR code being generated by your dashboard and then added to the, to the pallet? That's one part of my question. And then the other one, if so, who is applying the code or the uh, uh, identification on the pallet? Is it done by the customers or, or do you have, do you provide the service? That's, that's the question. Mm -hmm. We don't provide the service, but um, for example, if we are working with the cable drums, they are not uh, foreseen from a unique identifier. It's just a type of drum and an amount we are shipping back and forward between companies. They do want to like they do want to like to use a unique identifier, and they are going to print QR codes on it, which will state that each type is is unique and have its own number. And we can scan these numbers, so you can add the list with the numbers. And if you scan it on your mobile phone, we uh, the system is smart enough to recognize the product that this is a cable drum, and that you can add it to your shipment. It's also done with existing barcodes, which are on crates. But we could also, yeah, we always compare it to different keyboard entries. If you have an IoT device and you put it on your pallet, then we can read in the data from these um, IoT device. So it could also be done by RFID. And we are working together with different companies providing these items. But we, so for example, with Euro pallets, they are not uh, unique identified. So then you always have a type of item and you have an amount. And the important thing to mention with this type of items is you can choose in a shipment if you want to have this item stated on your balance. So I ship it to Olivier and I need to get it back from Olivier. Or I can say I will sell it to Olivier and I won't need to see it back, but my inventory will go uh, down. Clear. Yeah. Thank you very much your for question. your. Yeah, yeah. The, the only thing I was just thinking about: how do you get these systems uh, in your uh, dashboard? Um, and I was thinking that it was always done by scanning through the app. Uh, so, uh, but what you explain is that actually your app is smart enough to read different types of. Um, uh, exactly. Uh, unique. The uh, yeah. So so. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a barcode or a QR code. QR code. Uh, your app is picking up the data, and it's because I was triggered by your dashboard because I saw a QR QR code, uh, if I remember well, in one of your screens, yeah. and I I thought, okay, this is the yeah. marker, so so this should be on the product, 
and then uh, your app will recognize it. But I'm not sure if that was the reason for the QR there. No, the QR, who, uh, the ones you saw, that one is the one you can print or you can show it on your screen. For example, for the truck driver who is picking up uh, the shipment, he can scan this QR code on his mobile phone by using our application and he will directly have the right shipment he can uh, put in the right data in. So he can say, okay, confirm I have um, this in my truck and it is in transit to the new customer. So the QR code you saw is for getting the right shipment right away, but you can also scan barcodes on current crates, for example, or drums or roll containers or tags. Okay, and then and then as, a, as an owner or the one that has started the, uh, the item, uh, this person will link the barcode with, with the item in, in your system. So that's actually at the start of the, well, the onboarding yeah. of products, so to say. Yes, exactly. So if you are the owner of a product, you can um, create an item yourself. You can do a request to RTI blockchain, and then we will help you out, of course, by creating it. And then we could also add a list with different unique numbers, and then you are in business. Super. If you, you ship your items... Yeah, if you ship your items with unique numbers to your supply chain party, parties, you could also say, okay, after 30 days, I would like to receive it back. So it will count down the amount of days that supply chain partner has that specific item in stock. And after these 30 days, it is one day due, two days due. And you will see it, but also your supply chain partner will see it because both look into the same data again. Okay, clear. Sorry, there is one last question that I that I have just for the on, for the new customers. Uh, it, of course, uh, what you explained is the link between the dashboard and existing ERP system. To build this link, is that part of your service, or will it done by uh, uh, Let's Say Leopard? Is that is that uh, from our uh, side? It's part of our business. Okay. Clear. So you create a link between uh, the customers who have an ERP system with your dashboard. Yes, but also at the partner side sh should be something done in your own ERP system. That's your responsibility and we can do it our side and we can communicate together, of course, to get it done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your question. Um, Jim Robinson, would you like to come on and ask your question? Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. My question, just to uh, give you some perspective, is from the aviation perspective. So um, um, in a supply chain world, there's sort of two elements that we're exploring in blockchain, and that is linking a bag to a passenger through a, through a, um, a digital ID and a verifiable. So do you envision getting down to sort of items in creating unique DIDs for your um, supply chain? I don't hear you properly. Could you repeat it again? Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sometimes I can, but sometimes you not really. <laughs> oh, okay, I apologize for that in advance. Um, the question is, do you envision or is it possible to create um, um, verifiable credentials, so to speak, or did for each of your items? Um, in, in this case, um, the way we set it up at the moment for the RTI case, um, we don't use verified credential on item level. So um, uh, we didn't do it in that way. Um, I believe that we create basically fungible tokens kind of construction. So all items are equal and not uniquely identifiable. Um, we do work on a lot of SSI solutions. So you should very well could create uh, credentials specifically for a bag item, etc. but not using the RTI solutions at the moment. Thank you very much for that response. Thanks. And we do have um, a question that ca that's coming in from our YouTube live audience. Um, uh, uh, Papa Jelly is asking, how are you hiding the fact that there was a transaction between A and B um, from other parties not participating in the transaction? 
uh, without going into too much technical detail, because that's also a bit of the the the, the um, unique element that 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 that, uh, that RTI has is that that you use the right elements in the blockchain part, and that some of the parts are um, uh, transaction hashes uh, being stored on a blockchain part to make sure that certain transactions went through without revealing the detail of the um, uh, the individual transaction in this case. So the individual transaction can then be stored off chain and hashes as proof of the transactions are being stored on chain. Thus the other parties cannot see each other's movements in this uh, in this case. So that's, that's basically what the solution comes down to. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's high level how that, uh, that works. Okay. Does that answer the question? I think so, but we'll <laughs> it's, see. A, we'll it's see. a YouTube. Um, feel free to post a follow-up question in the in the chat. Um, another question that we have here, and feel free to um, uh, ask more um, if, as it comes to you. But another one <laughs> here was, um, "What are your clients saying about um, Do you see a significant?" benefits so you know what are the results that you're seeing from um the solution the, one of the results we see is that you don't have uh, these differences anymore because you are working with together on real-time data so when you have a dispute everyone is on it it's also because you agree with your supply chain bar parties to work in a new system so you are um, uh, it's a new way of working and it's on top of mind that you can use a lot of time and money by not registering these items. So we uh, make people aware of uh, how much money you can lose and by registering it, uh, you won't. You can always see where they are and from who you uh, can have them in return. But not having these balance differences um, um, is, is saving daily work from people on the work floor. So uh, yeah, we also have this calculator app. I will write it down in, in, in the chat, this link. And then you can fill in your own data regarding your organization. And you can see what you can save on um, not having these balance settlements anymore. I could also share my screen and quickly go to it. And it's only on that part of the supply chain what we are saving. One moment, I will go to it. And I will share my screen again. And actually, uh, besides just the, 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 um, uh, the things you're going to show right now and the benefits directly for the customers, the fact that you guys are growing so fast, that's proof to putting for the market. You see that everybody's very, really enthusiastic about the solution. And, yeah. And, that's true. Um, the case with the cable drums, the price that increased only this year, uh, 13 times for these wooden cable, cable drums. And all the time they uh, deliver their cables to their customers and they get the drum as the surface, but they don't get this drum back. They will just end up in the bin instead of being reused. So when you start adding deposit money fee on it, we will all have huge amounts of invoices and sending money back and forward regarding to these items getting back. But if you ship them and you make people aware that you need to send it back and they can be reused again and again, you will save a lot of money throughout the whole supply chain, of course. So I am at this calculator and these are only your saving for having this balance difference together. So say you send out a million items a year. This is minimum for uh, people working, organizations working with crates, for example, your fruit and vegetables go each day again and again to the supermarkets and need to be returned as well. And they go out uh, throughout the world, of course. And you have 250 relations. And the average time in hours for balance recognition per customer at a time uh, the estimation for each customer will be around 16 hours because you will need to have all your paper packaging slips, which are currently used. You have your Excel sheets and you have your orders and you will have these marker stiffs, you know, these yellow ones. 
and you will do it, but also your supply chain partner will do it and we will compare these lists together. And then you are going to your management and say, okay, this is the outcome, these are the sheets. He will go over it again and he will go to the director and someone needs to do something with it. So 16 hours is minimal, but of course you can um, fill it in yourself. Say 25 an hour, 25 euros for these uh, employee. And you do it only once a year. So this is already what you are saving only on not having these balance settlements anymore. So everyone can go to this link and apply these numbers for your organization. And you can see what the uncontrolled cost of balance settlements are within your organization. And you can see what it costs by using our dashboard. So this is one of the savings we can uh, we can show it to you. That's really um, amazing. That's it uh, is. very tangible. Yeah, it is. And that's what we are trying to do. We try to make things tangible and see that um, it is improving your business. But the problem with returnable transport items is, is that it is not your core business. You want to focus on your products. If you are selling fish, you want to sell fish. If you are selling cables, you want to sell the cables. And people forget that you need a load carrier to ship your goods. And if you're not getting it back, you can't deliver your fruit and vegetables to the customer, to the supermarket, for example. So it is very important to know where your returnable tra transport items are, that you get them back in time, and that you can reuse it. For the um, uh, poolers, the ones who are renting these items, it is also very important to know where these items end up in the chain so they can collect it earlier and they could also uh, bring it to the first party in the chain to reuse it again. Mm -hmm. And what we now have is all these different administration, each organization on its own, and some is reporting the data, the other one is also reporting data but is different, and it comes together and we never have this match. So that's what we do. We we connect this whole supply chain together. Yeah, that's really really fascinating. Um, and um, you know, what 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 sort of reaction have you seen from your customers so far? Different reactions. We also uh, I like this business case. Um, um, it's with all volunteers. So when we have fruit and vegetables and won't be uh, sold in stores anymore, it goes. Uh, for the people who need it and uh, all volunteers working there 70 plus and they said to us but but we can't work with an application we can't work with a mobile application we are not digitalized uh, it's not something for us so we said do you use mobile banking and in holland a lot of people are used to mobile banking so they said yeah well yes sometimes i will put i will send some money to my daughter or uh, granddaughter so i can use mobile banking and we said okay you can download our application on your own mobile phone on your smartphone and it is as easy as it is so the goods are coming in you check it if the amount is right and you confirm it and your work is done and they were so happy by using it each day again because they do get the food for free but they do have to pay the crates that are underneath it and yeah an organization like that can't lose the money because wow. that's actually needed for the people, of course. So even 70 plus can work with it. Um, we also get um, confirmation from customers. I really, it's really easy to use it, and I mean it. Mm -hmm. So when we ask for a reference, they said, and I mean it behind it. So that's very good for us as well. Uh, and I think also important that everyone who started with it uh, as a pilot last year, where we are still in a pilot phase, is still a customer right now. Right. So, I mean, you know, uh, a lot of people in, in the, where these shipments are, they don't want to be dealing with a complicated system on a computer or a dashboard, or they don't have that set up. Being able to do it on the mobile phone seems to be yes. really key. Yes. And that is um, most of the time at the mm -hmm. beginning of the chain and at the end of the chain, because in between you have this lot of protection organizations, they are used to work with applications. They do have the data already in their systems. We can connect it by an API and mm -hmm. uh, distribute it to the right parties. So that's why we are able 
to um, to help the whole supply chain to work together and not just the part. It's not only for the big companies. It's also for these very small ones. Yeah. Well, um, are there any other questions um, from the attendees? Feel free to post in the chat or raise your hand and um, I can bring you on, um, on here to uh, ask your question live. I do see something on our YouTube page. Are there future plans to add even more features to the application? Yes, continuously. We do have, yes, <laughs> continuously. Yes, of course, we do have a roadmap. But an important feature is to also be able um, to have deposit fee directly uh, change from one party to another. So to work with digital money, of course. Um, we could already start with it and we are ready for it, but we see that the market isn't. So the first step is to make people aware that they can use a system like RTI blockchain and they can get rid of their Excel sheets. We are going to trust each other because we work in the same data. Uh, we can't do something um, without knowing letting it know to your other supply chain party. And when we trust each other, we could also start working with a coin. So you could also do the deposit money fee directly or even better. It might be that we don't need the deposit fee in some cases in the supply chain. So we can eliminate a bit of the deposit fees which are being shipped um, forward and backward all the time. And I do have an example because currently we are uh, working with the user, it's also um, a supermarket chain. They have uh, a turnover of um, 400 million euros, but a deposit fee they are using is 1.3 billion. So that's a lot on these items. It's yeah. much more than the goods which are in. Yeah. And pe people really forget that, that the load carriers are. Uh, a lot of value. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Milu or for Olivier? Uh, we just got one uh, coming in from the uh, YouTube audience. We have about uh, a, a quite, quite a few people in the YouTube audience. Um, how does sovereign identity as a feature sound to you? I guess they're asking, um, does, is, is, is incorporating sovereign identity um, part of a future plan or future feature? Um, again, um, um, Incorporating self-sovereign identity into RTI, uh, well, at least at this point in time, um, it's interesting to, to explore, obviously, but I don't think it has an added value for the items that uh, we are using uh, RTI blockchain for. Um, the elements that Jim were referring to, basically being unique items, then uh, credentials is much more useful because then it um, relates to a specific item. And in the case of RTI, um, if, the, if it's crate A or B, as long as this, uh, it is the same type of crate, it doesn't matter which one returns, etc. You don't need to have the true unique identifier, but in the case of a suitcase in the uh, flight um, world, then it's a different story, obviously. So uh, I would love to explore the SSI combination into uh, the RTI solution, but um, given the market that they're in right now, I don't see a direct added value of creating individual credentials for every single item in this case, uh, unless you start working with really high expensive items and then um, yeah, but it could be very I think, interesting. Oliver, yeah. yeah, we do have an interesting case regarding this um, with cultural objects. Yeah. So currently we are uh, looking in a proof of concept phase that we, do, that we add different types of items to our platform. So now we do have these transport items, but also these cultural objects who are moving from one expo to the other. And then this looks like this self-sovereign identity because each unique object has its yeah. own ID and it, its own owner. So we do have a bit of an overlap uh, on this. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and and, yeah. and in that ca- and in that case, it really makes sense because the the RTI is related one on one to this specific object, and you can't replace it with a, a, a different one. So then you you have to have a unique identifier. But for a euro pellet or a crate uh, that is used in the in, in the fish industry, then it doesn't matter uh, if it's one crate or another. But but for for um, art objects, yeah, that that it's a different story. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, okay, quick question here from Andrew Hiran. How does the front end, how's the front end being served, I think? Is it via um, peer-to-peer or IPFS? <clears throat> it is a good question, and I really don't have the answer immediately, so I'm more than happy to figure it out for you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for any questions that don't get answered, feel free to um, reach out to us and we can um, uh, put you in touch with Ledger Leopard and they can answer that later on. Um, Jim, you're raising your hand. I'll let you be the um, uh, last question here. Jim, did you want to come off mute and an- ask your question? Maybe you just raise your hand. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Quick question or an observation, but are these pallets and crates, are these dead heading back to their owners? And is there a logistic solution to sort of optimize and let's say reduce carbon footprint? Yes, it is. Um, uh, it depends on the type of crate you are renting and the model that is behind it. So in some use cases, I am shipping to Olivier and I have to pick them up at the same location at Olivier's. But if they are in the same pool, so the same type of items and the pool provider is open to it, I could maybe perhaps pick them up at Karen's because she is my neighbor. So I can reduce my carbon footprint significantly. But therefore the end location needs to share the data with the pooler. So they do have valuable data where the items are end up and they can be picked up most efficiently. If we are open to share this data real time with the pool providers, everyone in the chain can help by reducing the footprint of uh, collecting the items with a full truck load. That's always better, of course, when you have it uh, half full, half empty. Um, sometimes it is the case that if I am a pool, I'm renting it and I'm shipping it to Olivier, I report it, but I have still the right to collect it at my neighbor because I can, uh, I have the right to have these amounts of total items I have rent available. So that's already quite efficient. Um, but also you see a lot of one-way pellets or one-way items if we can make it returnable, so you start using returnable items and you start using a platform to register these items on, you can uh, indeed increase or decrease your footprint again because you're not using um, um, paper, uh, carbon, uh, one-way pellets, etc. wood. So there is a lot of, to do for organizations to help to it. Thank you so much, Milu. Thank you, Jim, for your question. Um, uh, We're gonna have to wrap it up here. We're out of time. I just have a couple things I want to say here at the end. Um, Are you seeing my slides? Yes. Hold on, I'm not seeing my slides. Let me go to my own slide. There we go. So uh, uh, we're gonna wrap up today's uh, discussion with Ledger Leopard. Thank you so much to Milu and to Olivier. Um, We do have more of these sessions coming up. Um, The next one will be with um, our consensus Hyperledger and Ethereum uh, series. So we already had one on October 14th. You can find the recording for that on our events page and our YouTube as well. Um, The next one in that series is on November 3rd and then on November 16th. Um, And then in between those two, we have Splunk um, that we'll be talking about Hyperledger Fabric security. Uh, You can sign up for all of these events on um, hyperledger.org slash events. So please go to that page. 
um, and we'll see you at the next one. Um, uh, you may have seen in the chat, I was posting some YouTube videos for someone who's asking questions um, about where you can find videos. We had our global forum earlier this year. All of that was recorded. It's all on our YouTube page and all our webinars are on our YouTube page as well. So there's a wealth of videos that you can find on all topics and use cases and um, projects and technologies at Hyperledger. We encourage you to get involved, to join our community um, by attending these sessions. Um, check out our wiki to dive more into the technical aspects of each project. Join our special interest groups. Um, there's many ways in which you can get involved at Hyperledger. And um, thank you finally for watching. We appreciate you joining us here today. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Israel. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.